Hello and welcome to The Melting Pot. I'm your host, Dominic Monkhouse. The Melting Pot is a result of my hunger for optimising business performance. Scaling up organisations, corporate culture, customer addiction, building high-performing teams, along with a few other obsessions. I've spent the last several years working for and with some of the most successful top performing companies in the world. And this podcast is my attempt to synthesize what I've learned along the way to help you build a higher quality business and live a more fulfilling life. If you enjoy the podcast, you can find more information on today's episode. We do cracking show notes. They're at dominicmonkhouse.com. Hello and welcome to The Melting Pot. Today I am joined by two guests. I'm joined by Carl and Ben. They're the founders of Conversion Rate Experts. They are in the business of helping websites convert. They've been doing it for so long, they actually have the trademark on the term CRO. And they've helped some of the largest websites in the world. They've helped, I guess, Facebook and Apple and lots of big names in Silicon Valley. Mostly their clients are mere mortals. I used them uh, when I was at Pier 1. Those customers who are generating more than a million pounds of revenue online could all benefit from improvements in conversion rate optimization. So we talk about what makes a good website win and why that's the opposite of beautiful. And we talk about a bit about some of the things that they found out along the way around copy, user-friendliness, Uh, making the benefits clear, bundling. And we have a great conversation about some and all of that. Lots of the things they say are actionable insights for people. And of course, you can always go and buy a copy of their book, Making Websites Win, or wherever you get your podcasts, you can go and listen to 10 episodes of Making Websites Win, which is effectively the audio version of their book. They're great guys. They do a fantastic monthly newsletter. We have a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. This is Ben Jessen and Carl Blanks, and we're the co-founders of Conversion Rate Experts. We're a leading agency for conversion rate optimization, a term that we coined in 2017. And we build effective web pages and then stick our necks on the line by insisting that we carry out scientific A-B tests to verify that we've significantly grown our clients' businesses. And when you coined the phrase conversion rate optimization, did, was that like you made that up or it didn't exist before? You guys, you couldn't trademark it? We actually did trademark <laughs> it, Dom. <laughs> yeah, we did. Um, I'll tell you kind of how that came about. We um, we gave a workshop at a web business in, in, a, in a city called Litchfield in England. And it was kind of in the in the transition period between us kind of moving from in-house marketers to creating conversion experts. So we'd, um, we, was, we were starting to talk about what we did at that telecoms company to other businesses. And we, we, um, we were asked to do a workshop with um, a web business in Litchfield. And we spent the whole day talking through what we do. And it obviously didn't have a name. It was kind of a set of workflows and a, a set of procedures. And then at the end of the day, we went for a meal and we were walking around Litchfield. And one of the guys who, um, who was their SEO guy he said to us, um, you guys just need a name for what it is that you do because we've got things like SEO and we've got PPC, but you guys just need a, a catchy acronym. And we, we kind of just said off the cuff, well, it's conversion rate optimization. And that's what we named at, at the time our methodology when we kind of started presenting it at conferences and talking about it. And we actually trademarked the term, but then the kind of industry subsequently adopted it. And we decided not to... Not to defend the trademark because it was kind of in our best interests, really, that it was taking off and it was becoming well known because more people were searching for it and looking for it. And uh, and obviously, we we when we started doing it, no one had heard of the type of work that we were doing. There was testing and there was multivariate testing and there was A/B testing, but there wasn't kind of this scientific approach to understanding what to test. So we kind of rode the kind of the success of the term. And obviously our business has grown as more people have um, learned about conversion optimization. So um, it's kind of been in our best interests that it's it's gone mainstream. But yeah, it was originally the name of our methodology. So if, if you look back to any of our old conference slides from 2007, 2008, and we presented our methodology, it was actually called CRO. Aha. Uh-huh. 
Okay. And so you said, you just said there when you were talking about the evolution of the business that you were both marketers in a, in a telco. What were you doing before you did this? Carl was a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'll let Carl talk a bit about his science. And, yeah. And I, and I was in, and I was in web marketing. So no, <laughs> <laughs> I just realised I've not said I've literally not said a single <laughs> word yet. <laughs> and the more time that's passed, I said it is a challenge to see how long I could go without speaking. <laughs> yeah, I was a scientist. I did a PhD in uh, high temperature materials at Cambridge, and then I worked alongside Ben. We were working for a company that sold phones on the web, and um, and we realised in two thousand and five that multivariate tests and A-B tests, which are like just a, the kind of thing you do every day as a scientist, hadn't been applied to the web and, and really should be because in marketing, no one really knows any fact. Is that an overstatement? And, and so we started carrying out A-B tests to see what would work best on the website. And within 12 months, we tripled the sales. And we've got this amazing photo of the graph on the wall where the sales just went. We actually plotted them on a wall chart and we refused to scale the wall chart <laughs> when we actually went off it. We came within a centimeter of the ceiling tiles. And we realized in doing that, we realized a few things. We realized that A-B testing works ridiculously well, that there is a ridiculous merit in finding out what works, which only an A-B test, is, you know, a proper experiment can do. And we also learned that we we discovered things about conversion that no one else seemed to know. And so we were onto a we were onto a real winner. We knew how to step into a business and massively grow it. And what staggers me though is that it still seems to be a secret. So the number of times I turn up at an organization and their marketing is just driven by what somebody thinks might be the right answer. And they're still not doing any testing. I think some of it's a mindset thing. I think some people naturally gravitate towards taking a scientific approach and some people don't. So there's certainly an element of that. It depends what gets rewarded as well to a degree. Because what, what, one mm. thing that we found mm. interesting is over the years, you can kind of see where there have been shifts in how people approach websites and website design. So, I mean, I guess when I first started, it was all about having like a nice flashy, fancy portfolio of a nice looking website and you know people were interested in winning awards for having beautiful websites and um and for a long time actually beauty was kind of what was seen to be the the goal <laughs> with a website when, when things went from kind of offline to online beauty was important and then when people started doing seo seo became like the be all and end all so websites were kind of aggressively optimized towards search engines and they looked a little bit less beautiful with all those tidy gray keywords on white backgrounds. <laughs> but they, they, that kind of, that became the goal. And then, um, yeah, when kind of PPC and affiliate marketing took off, everything became very kind of aggressive and salesy. And I think the, the kind of markets matured to a point where successful web businesses understand that in order to be a successful web business, you have to put your customers and your visitors at the heart of what you're doing. And I think that's where conversion optimization comes in because what you're doing when you're optimizing a website, as we do, is you're finding out what it is that your visitors love about the product or service or website and you amplify that and you're finding out what the sales objections are and the usability problems and you're fixing those. And then you're making those changes in a very measurable and scientific way. So you're actually only putting live what your visitors are voting for in essence. So it's, it's quite a different approach in terms of the goal it's yeah let's do what's in obviously the customer's best interests and the business's best interests have to align but for, for a long long time i think a lot of people have just judged their website on how high it ranks in google or how beautiful it looks which are not very customer centric i suppose does everyone know what a b testing or if we we've mentioned it a few times so far but is it obvious to everyone these days what it is dom I think it might be worth just giving your definition of it. I, you're absolutely right, Carl. I, in the past, in a former life, I've hired you guys to work your magic for me. So, um, so I know what it is. But it, yes, do give me your definition of, of A-B testing. Tell people what, what that might mean to them. So it's no more complex than you redesign a page and then you, rather than doing what 
most website owners would do, which is just to put the page live and hope for the best, then you, for a certain limited time period, you show half of the visitors the old version, which we'll call the A version. You show half of the visitors the new version, the B version, and you track which of the versions is bringing in the most conversions. Usually it's the number of the most orders or revenue or something like that. And uh, a certain period of time, you track which one's winning. And then once there's statistically significantly enough data to conclude that one version really is outperforming the other and it's not down to chance, then you declare that one the winner. You promote it to be the new control, so that just the new normal, and you get rid of the page that lost. And so the benefit of that is that you're exclude by doing it an A-B test, you're excluding all the other factors, such as it might be that sales were going to go down or up that month anyway due to external factors like a sale or a TV campaign or seasonal fluctuations or the weather or one of many other things. And so you're eliminating all the other variables and you're isolating to find out you know, exactly what the difference in that page is. And also to make decisions only once there's statistically significantly enough data, because you know often it takes several weeks before you really do have enough data. And so that's the beauty of A-B testing is you really are scientifically knowing the facts about what's working in your marketing. And as a result, if, if you make a decision that lowers your sales, which does happen, then you don't keep it. And if you make a decision that increases the sales, then you do keep it. So everything you do is, everything that gets kept is actually growing your business rather than what most businesses do, which is to make a series of updates every month and they've no idea which things incrementally improve and which things are incrementally decreasing their sales. And do you suggest that clients make small changes or are these A-B tests quite significant changes? Are people changing the color of a button or is it, is it something bigger than that? Done well, it's understanding what's preventing your qualified visitors from converting and fixing those issues. <laughs> so done well, it's massive done, changes. Done well, it's it's pretty significant changes. And it's it's almost the kind of almost worth taking a step back and and thinking, well, with any business, you can make like loads of different changes. And some you can measure, some you can't. But the ones that are going to have the biggest impact on your business's growth are the ones to focus on first. And one trap that that kind of lots of people fall into when they start A-B testing is they do change things like the button color, or they just copy best practices from the competitors or from other websites. Or they have some kind of little debate in the office about things that they'd like to change with a website, and then they test that. And... If that kind of thing isn't going to make a material difference to your website's visitors, you're never going to get any significant results from it. It's a bit like that equation, GI goes to GO. So garbage in leads to garbage out. And so if the things that you feed into the testing software are garbage ideas that were never going to make much difference, then all you get out of the testing software is garbage, albeit optimized garbage. I remember being over in Ireland uh, at Web Summit a few years ago, and the guy from Optimizely was telling his story where he'd gone from Google to uh, Obama's campaign. And he did a sort of test with the audience. You know, he sort of said, look, here's image A and here's image B. Who prefers A, B? And everybody voted. And then here's a, here's a video. Who preferred the video? And, and here's some colors. And here's the ask. And he said, right, that's fantastic. So we've crowdsourced what we think is going to be the best campaign. And actually, that was the worst one, because the best one was all the ones that nobody voted for strung together was actually the best sequence for our campaign. And that was a that very graphical point made. And obviously, you ended up creating some software to and selling that software to run A-B tests for people. But you know, you guys have got, you guys have been doing this well before anybody else was using the term CRO, you coined it. You must have a huge library of things that work and don't and sort of the counterintuitive nature of some of those. I guess we do, to summarize at a high level, we do we do two things when we when we work on a client's website. And we do this regardless of the client. So whether it's one of, you know, Silicon Valley's big web businesses, or whether it's a scale up, or in some situations a small to medium business. The starting point is always to talk to the business owners and to say, well, what's your strategy for the business? What are your goals? How do you measure success? And what do you want your business to look like, you know, five years from now? And how is your website going to contribute to that? And how are you going to know if you get in there? 
So to kind of just take a step back and talk about what the website's for and what its role in the business is. And then once we've done that, you know that for different businesses, they have different goals. So for a social network, it, it might be hit, hitting a certain kind of critical mass of new users or referrals. For a SaaS business, it might be, you know, number of um, people going onto a free trial, then being upsold onto a monthly ongoing commitment. For an e-commerce business, it, it could be sales or revenue or average order value. So the first step is always to talk to the business owner, or, or, or if you're doing this internally, to kind of have a session to discuss, well, what are our goals for the business? And how does our website contribute to that? And it sounds so obvious to kind of say that, but it keeps you focused on the things that are going to have going to have the biggest impact on your business. So you don't get distracted by changing the color of a buy now button, for example. And then once you've got a feel for where you want to take the website, the next step is to understand where it's performing well and where it's underperforming. And it typically comes down to three things, really. The first one is the quality of the visitors and the readiness of the visitors. So are you asking the right people to do the right thing at the right time? So that involves looking at the different channels, your different marketing campaigns, the different visitor types, new visitors versus repeat visitors, new customers versus repeat customers and to see how, how they all interact with your website. Then it's to look at the usability of the website. So what are the things that are working particularly well and how can you exploit those elsewhere in the business? And what are the things that are preventing users from taking the action that you want them to take? And then in many situations, they want to take. So it's, it's about understanding the things on the website that create that friction from a usability perspective. And then it's about understanding um, good old fashioned persuasion and and sales. So of the visitors that do convert, what is it that persuaded them to convert on your website? And is that message consistently being used throughout all of your marketing materials? And of the qualified visitors that don't convert, what is it that's holding them back? What are their sales objections? And how can you overcome them? So because we go through this kind of research process, we've built a lot of experience in, well, what prevents website visitors from converting? And before you can answer that question, you shouldn't really, you shouldn't be split testing before you can answer that question, because you're going to just split test silly things or, or things that aren't meaningful. So yeah, we've built a lot of experience of what prevents visitors from converting, which are in the book, actually, which I've probably not mentioned, but then maybe should. But yeah, there's a whole list of things that kind of prevent visitors from converting. And then once, once you know what those objections are, what those issues are, then we've also got a big database of things that address those and the opportunities that most web businesses have if they can address those issues. Are any of those top of mind? It depends on the industry, actually. Software and technical, like consumer goods, they tend to have big objections with people not really understanding how it works or the usability or often very kind of detailed product-specific or user case-specific objections. And so that's kind of a general trend, which are the ones often with individual products. It's the kind of product message or the positioning that makes a massive difference. Usability comes up absolutely loads. Often intelligibility. Actually, what I, what I should probably list out is the um, the list from the book chapters, because yeah, the, the most common 15, I'll probably not go through the 15 problems that all websites have and cause visitors to abandon and reduce the sales are bad writing. So people can't understand the writing very well. Poor user friendliness, poor usability. The visitors not getting or perceiving that they'll get what they actually came to find. Lots of e-commerce stores suffer from that. People don't even believe the site will deliver what they want. Not understanding the benefits, the offers themselves not being irresistible. There's a whole kind of field of how to package and repackage and bundle things to make uh, the offers and how to present offers so that they look irresistible. Trustworthiness is massive, especially in certain industries like industries like you'd imagine financial services, for example, or there's uh, risk removal because obviously people are often hesitate because of risk. There's the overall kind of sales funnel Often sites try to do in one step what they should be doing in three or four or five steps. So you can't get someone to buy a yacht on the first visit. There needs to be a whole series of 
relationship things and and so many businesses are like that especially b2b there's a complexity managing complexity is a massive thing i should probably litter enough for now should i should I pause there <laughs> <laughs> and i mean the yacht one is that a real example where you helped a company sell more yachts we haven't actually we should selling houses is certainly one that we've been involved with and that's a complex uh, high risk high stakes high ticket value item and yeah selling houses is very different from selling toilet roll so the the psychology and the um trust and all those kind of things is is much more well the stakes are higher with selling a house you talked about the uh research piece are you looking often in organizations to see what happens offline to make sure that the lessons offline are being taken online Absolutely. I mean, that's that's a huge opportunity for many businesses. Um, often the client sales team and the marketing team are quite detached. And in some situations, even in different buildings or different parts of the world, and there's not that cross-pollination of, of what the salespeople say and what the website says. So what one exercise that we often we say is useful for a business owner to go through is speak to your best salesperson and hear what they say when they introduce themselves to a prospect for the first time and how they present the business. And then read your homepage out loud and look for discrepancies between the two. Because <laughs> I guarantee that the top performing salesperson is saying different stuff to what your homepage is saying. And they're having to do an awful lot more persuasion in order to get the message across and, and a lot more in terms of positioning in how they present the organization. So even, even subtle little things like comparing how your salespeople introduce the company compared to your website, you'll spot some huge opportunities there. And we've had some real big wins from just going and spending a few hours, an afternoon, a day sometimes, either visiting call centers or salespeople, or even going out there and trying to sell products face-to-face. Because your website really is your robot salesperson that works 24-7 and is responsible for selling your firm and selling your services. But most of the people that build websites have never actually experienced that. Mm -hmm. So there's a real kind of detachment between, I'd say, if the people who built your website couldn't pick up the phone and sell your product or service, then there's an opportunity there. (laughs) It It can be quite upsetting to take a marketing person and give them a sales call or sales meeting and see how they perform and see what their sales conversion rate is, because... Often you find that the marketing person who's writing the the words to sell on the website can't sell it. And you think, well, if they can't sell it face to face, they don't stand a cat in hell's chance of selling it on the website. Yeah. And for some reason in the world of marketing, that's kind of seen being able to sell the product isn't seen to be essential, (laughs) which is crazy. And so, yeah, I'd say all of our team are both analytical and what we hire for is being both analytical and being good on the interpersonal side so they kind of understand sales and how they work but they also have the analytical skills to like encapsulate that into words and into a flow so that the selling can be done at scale i mean when i'm working with clients and often tech firms you know i'm amazed that the person in charge of marketing very very rarely speaks to customers so one of the things i say to all executive teams is everyone on the executive team if you're in hr marketing sales and the ceo probably already talk to people and maybe the customer service person talks to people but only because they're angry but everybody should be talking to at least a customer a week because you've got to have a sense of what is it we do and who and and who is the core customer and what problem do we solve and often i try to get people to say and what's the question you would ask them which would then give you the opportunity to tell them who you are and what you do and people really struggle. And so that you're absolutely right. You know, the idea that could then from that poor place in terms of who's our customer and why would why would they want to buy from us, you could then jump and create a website. There's another huge side effect to doing what you just mentioned, Dom, as well. And that is it gives you a level of empathy that you just don't get looking at a Google Analytics graph. <laughs> so <laughs> and, and and empathy is just absolutely essential when it comes to positioning a product to align with the, with the clients or customers' needs. So without that empathy and without that understanding of why someone would need this product and use this product and what their fears are and what their concerns are, 
it's almost impossible to overcome those objections and to and to put together a sales message that actually reassures the customer and gives them confidence and puts them at ease and gets them interested and excited about the product. You really only get that when you're interfacing with the, the kind of real with real customers and with real customer feedback. So so yeah, speaking to customers is obviously one obvious way of, of getting that interaction. But even things like um, surveying people that are on your website when they're about to leave, speaking to the customer service team and doing user tests on your website with them so they can point out all the things that typically create friction or aren't easily understood. So um, empathy is absolutely a huge one. And most web marketers are kind of so isolated from the customer that it's Mm -hmm. hard to have that empathy. One of the things I often say to clients is ask the people who've just bought from you what it was that nearly made you not not sign up as a customer. They had to overcome some friction and some objections. And so, and it's likely that they're your target customer because they did actually go through those trials and tribulations and buy from you. But but just asking them what would have made, what would have made it easier or what nearly stopped them can be really powerful. And I don't know where I stole that from. I might have stolen it from your book. You did, but I'm glad you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> To be honest, I, I bet we did that together on Pier One. So you, you had an early heads up with that one. <laughs> Page one oh two. So well, so look, you wrote, you've written the book, which is fantastic. But you've been doing this for a long time. So why why the book now? It took us a long time to write. It, it. did. I mean, that, that, that's some of it. I should mention the title of the book because um, I didn't during the intro. Yeah, the book's called Making Websites Win. Yeah, it's been in the works for an awful long time. We. Um, we were originally approached by, I think it was Wiley in 2008, after we published an article about how to understand your visitors. And they, um, the article was popular and they, they liked it. They reached out and asked us to publish a book with them. And f- for whatever reason, we kind of, we didn't publish a book with Wiley at that time. But we kept on creating content to um, talk about what it is that we've learned and what we do with our clients. And we published content for a couple of reasons. Really, We did lots of content marketing as a company. And a lot of it is because when we're working with our clients, we document our capabilities. So we document what works, we document where we've had successes, we document particular workflows that have been useful for us. Um, So A, we can kind of reproduce those things internally, but also we find that by publishing that information, we attract either new clients or we attract people that are interested in CRO and would like to work with us. So we, we do a lot of content marketing and education in the marketplace. And as you say, Dom, most people still aren't doing CRO and it's it's perceived as a bit of a secret by those companies that do. So we find that by putting content out there, it helps our business and it helps the industry as a whole. So we've kind of been incrementally writing the book, one blog post at a time, I guess, and one case study at a time. And then um, we got to the point where lots of people kept asking us about the book and kept asking us when it was going to come out. So we kind of knuckled down and we put together our whole methodology, really, and how and how it is that we do things in, into one book. And in the end, we, we decided to self-publish. And yeah, it came out, I think it was about August last year. We've had a, a good reception to it. It's got some nice reviews. It's been recommended by companies like Apple, and, sorry, not Apple, Facebook and um, Google. And yeah, the team at Mars and E-Consultancy. So yeah, it's, we're pleased we did it, and it was it was glad it was great to finally get around to it and to um, kind of put that information out there. And then you also released an audio book, but with a twist. We did. Uh, we did. Oh, I was wondering yeah. what the twist was. It was a free podcast. <laughs> <laughs> we, we forgot to charge for it. <laughs> yeah, we um, one of the benefits of self-publishing because there are lots of. <laughs> Yeah, it was a load of work. But one of the benefits is that you have freedom to do what you want. And so we gave away the audio book as a podcast, mainly because the, the ratio of so many more people listen to podcasts than audio books. And, uh, and so we figured that uh, once we'd created it, it seemed a shame that the relative sales compared to paper books would be fairly low. Yeah. So it's now available if you search a podcast app for making websites win, then the whole thing's in there. It's an audiobook, and it's it's been really popular. It's been more popular than I think we would have guessed. It, it surprises us how many people have listened to the audiobook and then moved on to buying the book. But, but I say surprise; it was what we were hoping for. But we've been pleasantly surprised at how many people are 
getting into it from the podcast. Do you guys have a target customer size? Because I know you've worked with Google and Facebook and, you know, lots of large Silicon Valley firms. But is there a, you know, if you're in the UK and you're a firm, what outcome, is it outcome-based or as opposed to revenue-based? Typically, if if an organization's doing more than a million online in a year, then we should be having a conversation or at least having a session with them to discuss what their opportunities are. Because one thing that we find, is, especially with, I guess, smaller businesses, is we, we have a session with them where we discuss what the opportunities are. And if for whatever reason that there's, there's not that kind of much uplift potential for them to hire us straight away, they tend to come back and, and hire us in the future. So we've worked with lots of companies that, I mean, my fitness pal was small when we first started working with them and, and they had an exit from about half a billion recently. We worked with um, Top Cashback, who were quite small when we first started working with them. And then they've appeared in the Sunday Times Fast Track quite a few times. Quite a lot of our clients have um, have ended up in the Sunday Times Fast Track. We work with kind of startups that have found product market fit and are ready to really scale it and, and have got normally some kind of venture backing behind them in order to, the, to get market share. We also work with companies that are just profitable, doing really well and are aspiring to grow. And, you know, the kind of companies that want to be in the fast track or the Inc. 500. And we also work with large enterprise clients that um, that are either already doing this stuff ridiculously well, but appreciate that the cutting edge is worth a lot to them so that they hire us for that cutting edge. Or large organizations that um, maybe have been a bit slow to adopt conversion or optimization, but know how important it is and want to build that kind of capability themselves. So we advise lots of different types of clients at, at, at lots of different points in their in their journey. It's international too. We've worked with clients in um, 37 countries in 11 languages. So it's not just UK-based people. Even though me and Carl are in the UK, our whole team are based worldwide. Is there a big cultural difference in terms of removing some of the friction? You know, if I'm English looking at a website and a different culture, different language, is there a cultural difference that you've seen? There are cultural considerations, but I think people underestimate how universal like the human condition is and how human drives are. And so we've been pleasantly surprised at how the fact that we've had wins and massively grown companies in, in every country that we've worked in. We first discovered it in Japan where we, you know, we mentioned the World Phone Company. There was a point at which we wanted to carry out the same kind of experiments on the Japanese website that we'd carried out on the US website and had huge wins. And our Japanese staff disagreed with us on what we wanted to implement because we had it all converted and translated into Japanese. And the Japanese staff actually didn't want to push the page live because they said it was very un-Japanese and they didn't, their customers wouldn't like it. Because we knew about A-B testing, we said, okay, then we'll just run it as a test and see who wins. And our page thrashed theirs, and <laughs> we doubled their sales against their wishes. <laughs> and so it really taught us this. That was the first inkling that this hunch that we had, that giving customers what they want, making things easy to use, and overcoming their objections was going to work in any language. And even though we do have in-house, we have people who've... We, we kind of know which things are different in different languages. That's minor compared to the universality. It's the same reason that things like Star Wars and Harry Potter, the story doesn't need to be changed depending on which country it's in. Do you have any other examples where everybody thought the test would fail or even hoped the test would fail and then the, your tests won? I would say there's certainly generally a feeling that if the page is direct and in plain English, people often don't like that. They feel as if it's too informal. I'd say often in companies feel as if a page is too informal, whereas visitors love writing that's informal because they can understand it. That's really common. One thing that's on the other side, as far as one easy mistake to make when you're growing your business is what we call the cinema foyer effect, which is that um, sometimes no matter what you do on a page, you can't get a win and you can't improve it and and it stays inconclusive. 
sometimes it, it's analogous to imagine if you were running a cinema foyer and one week you put up certain posters and then you try putting the posters in a different place and you're wondering why the posters aren't working. And the reality is that the actual the customers are making their decision before they get to the cinema. And so if you wanted more people to see a particular movie and you're at a cinema, changing the foyer is, is actually like a red herring. And so sometimes we find that clients have pages where the page itself is a red herring, for example, because by the time someone arrives at their homepage, the visitors have mostly already made a decision on certain aspects. And so there's often a huge merit in finding a huge opportunity in finding out the point at which the visitors are making the decision and then influencing that. So occasionally it's it's actually off site and it's through the message that's given to them on affiliate sites or on whoever's referring to them. And that's the message to optimize. Fantastic. Um, knowing what you know now, question to both of you individually, what, what's the bit of knowledge? And it doesn't have to be about CRO, but what, what do you know now is that, that you would go back in time and change? I think the web's just a hell of a lot more competitive now. Being number one in the search engines is harder. Being number one on Google Ads is harder. Getting lots of attention for a website, it's much harder. It's kind of fierce. The, the, the competition is fierce now. It's at the point where I'd say with CRO, it's kind of you need to do it to survive, not just to thrive. It, it used to be that 10 years ago, the companies that were doing CRO would kind of dominate the markets. But now it's getting to the point where if you're not running these kind of experiments on your website and you're not having this very kind of customer centric approach to your marketing, it, it's hard to even compete for attention. So I wish we'd have published the book earlier because I think it would have been kind of Maybe a lot of our clients don't wish we'd have published the book. <laughs> but I think for our business, kind of getting the word out there while while things were easier would have been like advantageous. And really, I think kind of just um, in the very early days, we um, we were kind of sought out by companies that were already running A/B tests or were already interested in doing that. And we worked with you know lots of companies that today are household names, or you know they've gone on to kind of bigger and greater things. I think with those businesses, I wish we'd have got shares for a start. <laughs> yeah, you've said mine. <laughs> yeah, I wish we'd have got shares in those companies uh, rather than acting as like consultants and, um, and an agency. Yeah, I, I also wish I think we'd have um, would have published the book a bit sooner as well, because as you mentioned, you know, it's, it's been in the works for a while, and um, it's really kind of made a difference to our business. But I think in terms of how lots of companies approach website marketing and it's for the better and it's certainly for the better for the customers too. Yeah, all I was going to say, you know, you, the win-win is that customers get a better experience. Yeah, well, absolutely. You know yourself, the websites that you don't spend money with are the ones that you don't like. So even though there are websites who do dark patterns and all that kind of thing, I would say realistically our whole approach is making is lis listening to the visitors, finding out what they would like the website to be, and then steering the website and often the company and its products into the direction of being what visitors want, which is kind of what marketing is supposed to be. But the measurability and the all the kind of discipline it helps a company to become more customer centric. And other than websites that win, what books have made a difference to your? to your business along the way that you think other people should pick up and read? Other than our own book. <laughs> <laughs> I like the way you said it as if that would have been a valid answer. Yeah, yeah, our own book. <laughs> I don't know if you mentioned that. There's a book written in something like, is it 1907? By Claude Hopkins called Scientific Advertising, which gives a great, it's amazingly forward thinking that someone over 100 years ago got this stuff in an age before the internet. So there wasn't as much use for it. But uh, I'd say that's a great book to read. There's lots of bigger picture things and like real timeless wisdom in that book. It's a short book and I'd highly recommend everyone reads that. We Love to Dip by Seth Godin, which is a really short book. It's large pamphlet, 70 pages or something with not many words per page. And that's really good about positioning and about the importance of becoming the best in the world at what you do. Because the reality is when, as he says, when someone checks into a hotel in town, they never say, could you tell me what the second best Chinese restaurant is in this town? 
he says about being the best in the world, but he says, really, you need to, you definitely need to be the best. So you need to narrow what your world is. So it can be local, it can be within a very narrow vertical, but you really do need to become the best. And that was a real guiding principle in us in both being the best at what we do, but also by narrowing what we do. So we don't, don't do SEO, we don't do paid search, we we really made an effort to pick what at the time was so narrow that no one had no one knew what conversion was and the first slide at conferences we had to define what a conversion was but i think that's a great book fantastic gentlemen ben carl thank you very much indeed for being on the show today it's been great to catch up john yeah it's been great john ben and carl have been good enough to create a special listeners subscribers free ebook copy of making websites win and so if you go to dominicmonkhouse.com and you go to this episode you'll be able to find there in the show notes a link a link to a free copy of the book as well as a link to the podcast version audio version of the book as well thanks ben and carl Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. As a token of your appreciation, it'd be fantastic if you could go wherever you're listening and leave me a review. Those reviews really help other people find this podcast. For all information relating to this episode, you can go to dominicmonkhouse.com forward slash podcast. And there you'll find some fantastic show notes, additional reading and links relating to this episode. You can also find my blog and the past editions of my subjectively not crap newsletter. The simplest thing to do on the website is to sign up and I'll update you each week on the most interesting articles that I've read on all things relating to scaling up high performing teams, net promoter score, company culture, etc. For social, you can find me on Twitter, Dom Monkhouse and LinkedIn at Dominic Monkhouse, although LinkedIn is probably the best way to reach me, share your questions and comments and, and perhaps even recommend a guest for a future edition of the Melting Pot podcast. Thanks for listening.